Well, a warm welcome to this talk, Saturday the 16th of March. Now, I want to look at data today that shows that long COVID is actually no different to any other post-viral syndrome. It's just basically another post-viral syndrome. It's not some unique phenomena. Now, this doesn't mean to say that people that are claiming to suffer from long COVID are not genuinely suffering. They can be. But there again, so are people suffering from any other post-viral syndrome, a syndrome just being a collection of symptoms so quite interesting really but it's also interesting what this press release which is about a paper that's going to be released next month doesn't say it doesn't talk about other possible causes of spike protein pathology but we'll come to that in a minute let's look at this paper really quite um quite interesting and it looks like we probably need to drop the term long covid now, this is published in uh, Cymex, and it's going to be published as an official paper or as a presentation, not till next month, as we see here. So this is kind of like a preview. And because it's a preview, it doesn't really give us all the data we would like, but it certainly gives us some interesting data to be going on with. And uh, some things it emits as well that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about. So, Queensland data, Queensland in Australia. They say this long COVID is indistinguishable from other post-viral syndromes and other respiratory viruses a year after infection. So it is not something unique to the COVID virus. It's another post-viral syndrome which we know about and which are really quite, uh, really quite common. And of course, we learned from uh, Dr. Grimes and Professor Anderson recently that vitamin D is used up during infections. So part of this could be that people are very low vitamin D. If they've used up all the vitamin D to fight the infection, maybe they've got very low levels. So that's a variable worth considering. But it's not the point of this video, so I won't dwell on that at the moment. But long COVID indistinguishable, quite a strong language from other respiratory conditions. By comparison with influenza and other respiratory viruses, Australia, Queensland, now this was collected during the Omicron wave. No evidence, no evidence of worse post-viral symptoms or functional impairment a year after infection. So in other words, um, there's no evidence that the patients feel worse or are able to do less a year after infection, say COVID, say with influenza or other viruses or respiratory viruses. Um, long COVID may have appeared to be a distinct and severe illness because of the high number of COVID-19 cases. This is quite possible. There was a lot of people getting COVID in Queensland all of a sudden. And um, it could appear like a new syndrome because lots of people were presenting, whereas with influenza there was partial immunity, of course. But the other thing to bear in mind is Queensland does have a very high vaccination rate, as indeed do many of our countries, but in Queensland it's about 90%. Could this be part of the problem is not discussed in the paper. Now, they did take uh, data from 5,112 adult symptomatic individuals. So they took people that were symptomatic with these long COVID stroke post viral syndromes, things like brain fog, fatigue, cough, shortness of breath, change to smell and taste, dizziness, rapid or irregular heartbeat and generally not feeling that that well now they did pcrs now the pcrs the preliminary chain reactions they were conducted between the 29th of may and the 20 uh, and the 25th of june 2022 now of course um pcr is done for influenza as well as for covid it's the both it's the, the they're fairly similar tests so PCR confirmed infection for COVID-19, there was 2,399 individuals. PCR negative for COVID, 2,713 individuals. So a lot of people were suffering post-viral syndromes who hadn't had COVID. Influenza positive, 995. So this gives us a group of uh, 2,399 with COVID diagnosis and uh, 995 with um influenza diagnosis now those numbers sound quite a bit different but of course this is taken into account by the statisticians and those numbers are, are enough to give us pretty good quality data actually so i'm really quite happy with that now the results were collected a year later so notice that it was 2022 the pcrs were done the diagnosis was made how the patient patient was feeling a year later it was done in may and june 2023 now this is quite high of people that di were diagnosed positive Still reporting symptoms, 16%. Now, 
Now, as a post-viral syndrome, for people still reporting symptoms a year later, 16% is surprisingly high to me. To me, it's surprisingly high. Um, could there be another cause? But that's not mentioned in the paper, but 16% is high. If you're used to treating this, let me know if you think 16% is high. It sounds very, very high to me. For example, for a post-influenza uh, condition. So 16% still reporting symptoms, 834 out of the 5,112. Now, still reporting moderate to severe functional impairment, so interfering with activities of daily living, really, 3.6%. And again, I would have thought that's fairly high. Sounds high to me. Those still reporting symptoms after a year. Now, between post-COVID and post-influenza, those still reporting symptoms, they just say there's no difference between those reporting symptoms post-COVID a year later, post-influenza a year later. They don't give the numbers on that, frustratingly, but they don't give the numbers, but they do say there is no difference. So we can take them at their word. There's no significant difference between that. So there's no difference. It's both the same. It's another post-viral syndrome, not a unique pathology. And in a sense, I think this is, well, it's hard to say it's good news because we're talking about disease. But it's good to know that we're not talking about a, a new separate phenomena here. This is another post-viral syndrome, according to this data. Now, those with uh, moderate to severe functional limitations a year later were given the numbers. Non-COVID adults, 3%. Uh, COVID positive adults, 4.1%. Influenza positive adults, 3.4%. Now, OK, the, the COVID one there looks slightly worse. 4.1%, uh, um, but it's, there's actually no significant, significant difference between these in the overall numbers. Now, this is from uh, BMJ Public Health. A comparison at 12 weeks post-infection. This is a set, this is a uh, same authors, but this is a, another study from British Medical Journal, or some of the same authors, I think. Ongoing symptoms after COVID at 12 weeks, 21%. Um, Ongoing symptoms after influenza at 12 weeks, 23%. So again, slightly less people complaining of symptoms after COVID 12 weeks later. But again, the numbers aren't statistically significantly different. They are the same. So we're getting the same post-viral effects 12 weeks after COVID as 12 weeks after influenza. Um, a year after COVID as opposed to a year after influenza. And a year after COVID or influenza, both in terms of the patient not feeling right and functional deficits, just the same. No difference between those groups. Uh, moderate to severe functional impairment after COVID was 4.1. Moderate to severe functional impairment after influenza, 4.4. No difference there in that, uh, in that time period after 12 weeks in that other study. Obvious question not addressed, presence of spike protein antibodies. Now, when you have a COVID infection, the immune system is going to eradicate, obliterate, eliminate the SARS coronavirus too, or get rid of it altogether. Now, some people with um, compromised immunity, it could take them quite a few months to do that. That's why we can get mutations and it can go on for, a, for quite some time. But the vast majority of people will eliminate it altogether. And even people with de uh, depressed immune systems will eliminate it altogether at some point. So the virus will be eradicated altogether. That means the amount of spike protein will start to go down. But if for some reason the body is still producing spike protein on an ongoing basis, as we know happens in some post-viral, uh, post-vaccine syndromes rather, this is, sorry, post-vaccine, not post-viral, post-vaccine syndromes, then because the virus is still being produced, the antibody to the viral spike protein would still be high. So what we need to do is we need to test for the presence of the antibody to the spike protein. If that's present, then the spike protein is probably still there and we could be dealing with a post-vaccine syndrome. If the person is still feeling unwell, but there is no antibody to the spike protein, meaning the spike protein has now been gotten rid of, then we're probably dealing with a post-viral syndrome. This really does need to be done. So post-vaccine syndromes, potentially ongoing spike protein antibody. Um, post-viral syndromes, a year later, wouldn't expect to see spike protein antibody in any appreciable amounts, but that wasn't mentioned in the paper. But I think it is important because um, 
Queensland has about 90% adult vaccination. So uh, pity they didn't take that into account, but there we go. So obvious question not addressed. Dr. John uh, Gerard, Queensland Chief Medical Officer, and I agree with this bit. These findings underscore the importance of uh, comparing post-COVID-19 outcomes with those following other respiratory infections and offer further research into post-viral syndromes, indeed. And I, I've certainly seen patients who are, um, well, uh, post-viral syndromes can be life-threatening, um, can damage all sorts of uh, organs around the body. Um, Post-viral myocarditis, when I worked on coronary care, was the most common indication for heart transplant. I think it probably still is, in fact. Um, so these are common, viral, viral infections are common, but uh, the amount of knowledge in them is not that great. So that, that's, a, that's a point well made. We need more studies into these. Furthermore, we believe it's time to stop using terms like long COVID, because it's just another post-viral syndrome. Now, I'm, I'm saying just here... Um, don't, don't, we have to have a complete empathy and sympathy, whatever the right term is, for, for people with uh, long COVID or post viral SARS coronavirus 2 syndrome. Um, it doesn't mean to say it's an insignificant thing, they can be very ill with it, but they can, people can be after influenza as well. It doesn't seem to be a different syndrome, a new syndrome is the point this is making. They wrongly imply that there is something unique. This is the, the, the doctor speaking, Dr. John Gerard. They wrongly imply that there is something unique and exceptional about longer term symptoms associated with the virus. This terminology can cause other unnecessary, uh, can cause unnecessary fear. And there's a few other uh, references there if you want to check them out for yourself. So there we go. I'm actually fairly reassured by that. Uh, but we really need to know more about the differential diagnosis between long COVID, post-viral long COVID, post-viral syndrome and post-vaccine syndrome. And the testing for the ongoing presence of the spike protein antibody is an obvious way forward. So obviously we would expect the obvious way forward to be taken or not. But we'll leave that there. That's a separate debate so overall i think that's uh, fa fairly fairly good news influenza and covid and other respiratory viruses very very similar post viral syndromes more to come on this i suspect we'll probably get more data when the paper actually comes out in april and let's hope we get more data comparing post vaccine with post viral syndromes as well thank you for watching <laughs>